Okay, so uh, the first thing I want to talk about is this. This is the um, this is the formula sheet that you get for the AP exam. Um, I will post this formula sheet on my website. It's not protected. If you search, if you Googled uh, AP Biology exam formula sheet, you would get this. But I'll post it on my website in case you're just curious at looking at it. Uh, it's got a ton of stuff on it. But the thing that you really need to know is um, the vast majority of this stuff, it gives you what all the variables mean. So a lot of it's just going to be plug and chug. I wouldn't get too sort of anxious about this. Uh, even though there are a lot of formulas, you have to be able to select which formula to use, which is ultimately the difficult part. But once you know which formula to use, it's really easy to figure out uh, how to use them because uh, all the stuff is, is given. It tells you what each variable means, right? So here's the front of it as well. So AP Biology Equations and Formulas. And we're going to go over these uh, today as to which ones are going to be the most important and um, which ones are used the most often. <clears throat> so metric prefixes. That's the first thing. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about metric prefixes because I think you guys have a pretty good idea of how to do them. Um, some of you guys might know that uh, like King Henry died by drinking chocolate milk. You guys aware of that? Yes. Okay, so this means kilo, hecto, deca, base, deci, centi, milli. So for instance, if I wanted to convert something from uh, let's say I wanted to know how many uh, millimeters 8,000 kilometers was. So 8,000 km to mm, right? I would say, okay, I'm going to need to go one, two, three, four, five, six spots over. So I do 8,000. Here's my decimal place. One, two, three, four, five, six. And I put a zero in each of those spots. Go back and do my commas, boom, 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 8 billion, right? Is that easy enough? Everybody knows how to do that? All right, now, uh, worth noting on here, that will not work with their prefixes that they give you, okay? So for instance, let's say it asks you to convert from um, centimeters to picometers or something like that. Okay? And you're like, oh, no problem. I'll just go one, two, three, four. So I'll just move the decimal place four times. That is not correct. And the reason why it's not correct is if you look at the factors, you go from 10 to the negative 2 to 10 to the negative 12. That's actually a factor of negative 10, 10 to the negative 10th, right? So, so that's not, it's not four spots. It's more than that. So you need to know how to do those things uh, just with normal conversion factors like you would any time. Anybody have questions on that? Okay, now there's one thing that is slightly more difficult, and that is if they throw in any stuff, uh, and this is generally used for ecology and maybe for surface area and volume calculations. Uh, if you need to convert between um, like centimeters squared and millimeters squared, or centimeters cubed and millimeters cubed, because this is not exactly what you think. Okay, you'd be tempted to say, okay, I know that I have, if I have 80 centimeters, that there are 10 centimeter or 10 millimeters in every centimeter, and therefore uh, I would go like this: 80 centimeters times 10 equals uh, 800 millimeters. Okay, that is correct for centimeters and millimeters, but this isn't centimeters and millimeters. This is centimeters cubed and millimeters cubed. And so what you need to do is take your 80 centimeters times 10 and then take whatever power it gives you on your unit and apply that to your conversion factor. So 80 times 10 cubed, 10 cubed is 10 times 10, which is 100 times 10, which is 1,000. So that's actually 80,000 millimeters cubed, right? The reason for this is if you think about it, Let's take this box here and say this box is one centimeter, right? So this is one square centimeter, and I wanted to convert it to one square millimeter, or to, to square millimeters rather. So I divide each of these things into 10. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Sure. 
Okay. Now, it doesn't take very long to see that there is not actually just 10 boxes in here. There are 100 boxes in here now. Because in order to figure out how many square millimeters now I have, I need to take 10 millimeters times 10 millimeters. Whereas before, I took 1 centimeter times 1 centimeter. 1 times 1 is, 10, is, is 1. 10 times 10 is 100. Right? That's why we cube this. So similarly here, for 80 kilometers, so we take 80 times 1,000. But then since this is kilometers squared, we do 1,000 squared. And 1,000 squared is a million, so that would be 80 million kilometers. Or sorry, meters squared. Questions on that? Easy enough? OK. Next, Gibbs free energy. So first thing I want to do is talk about what these things mean because even though it says entropy and enthalpy and Gibbs free energy, I want you to have a better understanding of what those mean in case they ask you a question on it. Okay. So it says delta H is the change in enthalpy. What is the change in enthalpy? What is enthalpy? Yes. Nope. Enthalpy. Nope. Enthalpy. It is the total energy of the system. So enthalpy is total energy. Okay, Entropy is disorder, total you know, chaos within the system, whatever, right? So this is total disorder. And then Gibbs free energy. It's exactly what it sounds like, free energy. This is energy that you can use to do work. Energy that can be used. So when we say that um, some of the total energy or the usable energy is lost in every transfer of energy, what we mean is that the Gibbs free energy is going down. Right? OK. So the way that I normally explain this, the way that I normally relate this, is instead of using energy, I use information. Okay. So let's say we're talking about your textbook, your, your AP Biology textbook. You got 1,000 pages or something in there. And so you would say that your total information was 1,000 pages worth of information. Okay. Your textbook is nicely bound. It's got a table of contents. It's got an index. You can find things whenever you want them. And so you say the disorder of that textbook is very low. We'll call it zero. Okay. So if your total number of pages was 1,000 and your disorder is zero, that means your usable number of pages is 1,000, right? Okay. Now, let's change things up. Let's take this and let's tear those pages out one by one, right? So we have 1,000 uh, uh, loose leaf pages now. And then we toss them in the air, you know, and they make like a confetti and they all come back down. How many total pages do you have? 1,000. What did you change? You change the disorder, right? You raise the disorder like crazy. Now it doesn't go page 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. It goes, you know, 679, 532, 448, like, you know, just random, right? And so the disorder is massive. And so you would take your total number of pages, which is 1,000, minus how disordered it is, and you get your usable number of pages, which is essentially zero. Right? Your book is not useful at all to you because you're like, man, I don't know how to do Gibbs free energy. I'll just look it up in my textbook. Oh, uh, wait, it says it's on page 67, but I need to find page 67 out of 1,000 a, a here, and uh, it's not between page 66 and page 68. It's just you know in a random spot. Right? Make sense? OK, a couple things you need to know about this as well. Um, we can say that if the delta G is negative, we know that that's called a spontaneous reaction. If you've ever had AP Chem, you know that. Um, and uh, spontaneous reactions are those reactions that can occur without any outside uh, any outside uh, energy. So they don't require any energy source to happen. Okay. Uh, we generally in biology say these are catabolic reactions, meaning ones where a larger molecule is breaking down. Um, but for a positive delta G, we would say that's a non-spontaneous reaction. 
meaning you do have to have an outside energy source. And so generally for that, we say that those are anabolic reactions, ones where you're gonna be building a larger molecule from smaller molecules, a polymer out of monomers, okay? Now, in chemistry, there's another distinction, and that is that if you have a negative delta H, that's gonna be what's called an exothermic Uh, or exergonic reaction. If you have a positive delta H, that's going to be endothermic or endergonic. That means that it's going to absorb energy. Okay. However, in biology, we can generally say that if something is exothermic, it's spontaneous, and if something is endothermic, it's non-spontaneous. And the reason why we can say that in biology and they can't say that in chemistry is because of this thing, the temperature in Kelvin. Because in biology, the temperature can only be in a very specific range. I would say from about a zero degree Celsius, which is uh, 273 Kelvin, up to uh, like maybe 100 degrees Celsius under normal cases, which is which would be um, 373 Kelvin. So a very narrow band of energy, or a very narrow band of temperatures rather. But in chemistry, sometimes you say, what would happen if this uh, reaction happened at 5,000 Kelvin? Well, what would happen to a biological system if it was at 5,000 Kelvin? It would die. It would all just, just break apart. It doesn't matter, right? So at that point, it's not related to biology anymore, and so we don't need to work about it, worry about it. So uh, we say that uh, exothermic is spontaneous, endothermic is non-spontaneous. Questions about that? Okay. Hardy-Weinberg equations. So um, I said last year when I was going over these that there hadn't been a uh, AP exam in 10 years that didn't have a Hardy-Weinberg equation on it. Okay. So guess what? Last year there was no Hardy-Weinberg equation at all. Uh, what does that mean for you? There's definitely going to be a Hardy-Weinberg equation this year. I guarantee it, sort of, right? I'm pretty sure. I'm, I'm feeling, feeling good about it. So definitely know how to do this. I, I sort of promise that it will definitely pay off, right? All right. So what do you need to know about it? P squared is homozygous uh, dominant. 2PQ is heterozygotes. Q squared is homozygous recessive. So then it says in this question, in a population of rats in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium for eye color and fur color, the red eye allele, big E, is dominant over the black eye allele, little e. The brown fur allele is dominant over the white fur allele. In a sample of 100 rats, 8 had white fur and black eyes, 15 had brown fur and black eyes, 25 had white fur and red eyes, and 52 had brown fur and red eyes. Calculate the frequency of big E, little e, big F, and little f. Okay? That appears kind of overwhelming. Is that an overwhelming question? It's actually not so bad, and I'll tell you why. Uh, if you can do Hardy-Weinberg at all, this question is very easy because all you have to do is not get overwhelmed that there are different phenotypes here because all you're really concerned about is one trait per phenotype. Okay. So for instance, I want to find any time that we're doing a Hardy-Weinberg equation, we know we're always interested in Q squared, which is the um, homozygous recessive uh, genotype and therefore the recessive phenotype, right? So I found the re recessive phenotypes, which are black eyes and white fur, right? And so I say, okay, eight of them have black eyes, 15 of them have black eyes. So that's eight plus 15 that have black eyes, which is 23, right? So 23 of them are little e, little e. Following so far? Okay, so that's q squared. So now I need to just figure out the frequency. So how many total rats were there? 100, so I say 23 divided by 100, that gives me 0.23, which is equal to q squared. How do I find q given q squared? Square root, so I take the square root of 0.23 equals q. So Q is equal to something. Uh, square root of 0.23 is 0.48. How do I find P then? 1 minus 
that gives me 0.52, which is equal to P. So already I figured out that big E is equal to 0.52 and little e is equal to 0.48. Right? Now I just need to know for uh, white fur. So it says that 8 of them have white fur and 25 of them have white fur. So that's 8, oops, that wasn't the number 8. 8 times, uh, sorry, plus 25 equals, and that was for white fur, is equal to 33, and that's going to be little f, little f. So I take 33 divided by 100 equals 0.33, which is equal to q squared, or sorry, yeah, q squared. Right? Then I take the square root of 0.33 to get q. So square root of 0.33 is 0.57. That gives me Q. Then I do uh, 1 minus that, 0.43, and that gives me P. So then I know that big F is equal to 0.43, and little f is equal to 0.57. Then I win. That's it. That's all I need to do. Right? Is that difficult? Not really. Now, um, some things to note. Uh, you have given to you, I will provide for you, four function calculators plus square root. It's the only calculator that you're allowed to use. You cannot use a scientific calculator, can't you not use a graphing calculator. Just four function plus square root. Those are like the little ones that look like this that also have a square root key. Okay? That means that you can't uh, square anything. There's no square button, right? So like when we were doing our metric conversions up here and you wanted to do a thousand squared, there's no square button, so what do you do? A thousand times a thousand. There's also no cube button, so what do you do? Well, ten times ten times ten. But yeah, you get the idea, right? So you do it three times. Make sense? All right. So, uh, easy enough. Laws of probability. Um, you will not need to use this one. This is for mutually exclusive, exclusive um, events, and we don't really deal with those in biology. Uh, so the next one that you'll need to use, though, is if A and B are independent, then the probability of A and B both happening is equal to the product of the probability of A times the probability of B. Okay? So um, Calculate the probability of a female rat with brown fur and black eyes and a male rat with white fur and red eyes having offspring with brown fur and red eyes. Okay, there's two ways that you can do this. If for some reason it asked you to make a 4x4 four four Punnett square, the way that you would do that is you would first figure out their gametes. And the way that you determine gametes is you take their genotype, which is big F, little f, little e, little e, and you foil it. First, outside, inside, last. So first would be big F, little e. Outside, big F, little e. Inside, little f, little e. Last, little f, little e. You guys know how to foil? Easy enough? Okay. Uh, and then you take the second one, which was um, little f, little f, big E, little e. And you get uh, first, big F, little e. La outside which is little f, little e. Uh, inside, which is little f, big e. Last, which is little f, little e. Okay, And then you would make your Punnett square, 4 by 4, like this. And you'd put your other gametes over here. So uh, little f, big e, little f, little e, little f, big e little f, little e. And then you'd go through and actually do this thing. So go boom, 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 boom. And you do that for every single one of those boxes. Okay. If it specifically asked you on an FRQ to produce a Punnett square for this, then do this. Otherwise, do not do this. Okay. You will run out of time. This is like, this is going to take like 10 minutes if you did this. And, and that's not worth your time. 
So what you're going to do, instead of making a 4x4 four four Punnett square, is you're going to make two 2x2 two two Punnett squares. One for each trait. So the first trait is uh, fur, and so we've got big F, little f, little f, little f. And the second one is for um, eye color, which was little e, little e, and then big E, little e. So that's big F, little f, big F, little f, little f, little f, little f, little f, and big E, little e, big E, little e, little e, little e, little e, little e. Make sense? Is this easy enough? Okay, so now let's solve the question. It says, um, having offspring with brown fur and red eyes. Brown and red were both um, dominant. So that's the dominant allele over here. And then the dominant allele over here. So what's the frequency of the dominant allele for fur? Or the frequency of the dominant um, uh, genotype? 0.5, right? Times the frequency of the dominant genotype for um, the eyes. 0.5. So what would we expect then? 0.5 times 0.5? 0.25. Right, so 25% uh, would be the probability of a female with uh, this genotype and a male with that genotype having offspring with brown fur and red eyes. Much faster than doing this and then all the gametes and stuff like that, right? Okay, questions on this? Next, chi-square. Chi-square um, is, is grouped in with the rest of these statistical analysis and probability equations. There was a question where you're supposed to calculate standard error a couple of years ago. Uh, it just gives you the stuff. It just gives you the, uh, the equation and you just plug it in, or the, the variables and you plug them in. It's really not, not difficult at all. Um, if it wants you to calculate standard error, it'll say, hey, calculate the standard error. If it wants you to calculate standard deviation, it'll say, calculate the standard deviation. Or it might say, what is two standard deviations for this data or something like that. Okay. Um, if it wants to calculate the mean, it'll say, calculate the mean. If it wants you to calculate chi-square, it might not say chi-square. It might say, determine if these results are statistically significant. Right. And if it does say that, then what you're doing is calculating chi-square. Okay. So this is all about statistical significance. Okay, so let's do a question um, that is similar to one that you could see on chi-square. Okay, it says the parent generation of the previous question breeds and produces 50 offspring. The phenotypes are listed below. You suspect there's another gene interaction changing the frequency of phenotypes. Calculate the chi-square and determine if your results are significant. Okay. So the first thing that I want to do here, anytime you use chi-square, you need to develop a hypothesis. right? So my hypothesis, and I'm going to use an if-then statement for a hypothesis to make sure that I can't be wrong because um, then I can test. What's up? This would be an FRQ, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Would all of these be FRQs or would some of these be multiple? Some of them could be multiple choice. Yeah. Like the previous question, the probability question, could definitely be in multiple choice section. Yeah. All right. So my hypothesis is that there's some gene interaction. Let's say I think it's a gene linkage. Okay, I say if there is a gene linkage, um, offspring, phenotype distribution, will deviate from expected. That's my hypothesis. Anytime I make a hypothesis, what else do I need to do? Null hypothesis. This is the hypothesis that there's nothing out of the ordinary happening. So null hypothesis is no gene linkage uh, exists. Okay, so for chi-square then. I've got to have observed values and expected values. So I need to go, and these are my observed values. And then I need expected values. OK? 
Okay. Now, I'm going to use the uh, Punnett square from the previous question to determine my expected values. So, brown and red, we already determined that. That was 25%, um, right? That was what we were determining here, brown and red. So, that's 25% of the total offspring, which was 50. So, what's 25% of 50? 12.5, right? Now, brown and black. So, brown was this, and black was this. So, that's still 50, 50, so 25, right? So, that's still going to be... 12.5. In fact, all these are going to be 12.5 based on our Punnett squares because all the probabilities were 50-50. Right? Questions on that? How I got the expected? Yes, Alan? I'm so confused on how you got the expected. So, so we determined that our probabilities were 0 0.5 times 0 0.5, which is 0.25. Right? Then it says that there's a total of 50 offspring. So we took 0.25 times 50, which is 12.5. So we expected 12.5 offspring to be, yeah. Okay, so now we need to do chi-square. Chi-square is where you um, sum up all of those uh, equations up here. This stands for summation of all these equations. So what we're going to do is we're going to take um, brown and red and brown and black and white and red and white and black. And we're going to do a separate equation for each one. So brown and red was 22, which is our observed, minus our expected, which is 12.5. Square that value, divide it by 12.5, plus the next thing, which is brown black, which is 10 minus 12.5 squared divided by 12.5 plus the next thing which was 8 minus 12.5 squared over 12.5 and then again you've got 10 minus 12.5 squared divided by 12.5 plug them in so 22 minus 12.5, 9.5. Oh no, my calculator doesn't have a square key. What do I do? Multiply by 9.5. And then divide by 12.5. And I get 7.22. Plus the next thing, which is 10 minus 12.5 times negative 2.5 divided by 12.5 and that gives me 0 0.5 plus the next thing which is 8 so 8 minus 12.5 divided uh, 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 answer times negative 4.5 divided by 12.5 and that gives me 1.62 and this one is the exact same over here as brown black uh, it's 10 so we'll do 0.5 again so then we do 1.62 plus 0.5 plus 0.5 plus 7.22 and we get 9.84 so chi square is equal to 9.84 Okay, now we gotta do something with that. So we go up here to our chi-square table and we gotta find out how many degrees of freedom we have. How many possible choices are there? Four, so what's our degrees of freedom? Three, it's always one minus. And it actually says that on the formula sheet, right? It says uh, degrees of freedom are equal to the number of distinct possible outcomes minus one, right? So you don't need to memorize that. Um, so three here, and then I gotta wonder if I should use 0 0.05 or 0 0.1. Is this a soft science that we're doing or is it hard science, genetics? It's hard science, right? So what do we wanna use? 
0.01, this thing. So we got uh, 11.34 is our critical value. And that is greater than 9.84, which is our chi-square. So what do we do? Fail to reject null hypothesis. So looking at this data with our human brains, uh, we're like, oh man, that looks pretty significant. 22 were brown and red, even though I were expecting 12.5. Right? I bet there's something going on. Is there anything going on? Nothing going on. Right? So no gene linkage exists because we failed to reject the null hypothesis. Make sense? Okay. Other stuff you might see. Um, rate and growth. This is for population growth. They'll give you values for these and you just plug them in. You're not going to need to do any uh, uh, calculus or differential equations or anything like that. Uh, you just, you just plug them in. So don't worry about that. Um, temperature coefficients, same thing. They will give you a rate 2 and a rate 1 and a temperature 2 and a temperature 1. You just plug them in and you get your Q10 value. This is usually used for kinesis. So if it's asking you about like the difference um, between when a, uh, a lizard is uh, basking in the sun versus when a lizard is swimming and it's like heart rate or something like that and calculate the Q10, this is how you do it, right? Primary productivity calculations. Let's say that um, it was talking about eutrophication of a pond, and it said that before this uh, runoff, before the eutrophication, the um, milligrams of O2 per liter in the water uh, were like, I don't know, uh, nine, that's not a 90, 95 milligrams O2 per liter, right? And then um, it wanted to know uh, what the milligrams carbons fixed were before. You would take 95, multiply it by this. That gives you the milliliters of O2 per liter. And then you take that value, multiply it by this, and you get the milligrams carbon fixed per liter. Just, there's nothing else to it. There's no fanciness. You just multiply by two values. That's it. Right? Water potential. Here's a tree. Okay. Uh, in this tree, if I wanted to get uh, a water up to the leaves, I need two different forces to do that. The first force is provided by the leaves uh, as water evaporates away and it creates areas of low pressure. That's called transpiration pull. And transpiration pull is represented over here by psi sub p. Okay, that's called the pressure potential. Okay, there's also going to be um, water forcing itself into the roots called root pressure. And root pressure refers to the, um, when you have uh, hypotonic soil and hypertonic roots, water tries to flow from the soil into the root and that is using psi sub s, which is solute potential. So if you wanted to know the total force of water as it's moving up through a tree, you would take psi sub p plus psi sub s equals the total water potential. Easy enough. If you've had uh, AP chemistry, you could um, recognize this formula here. This formula represents um, uh, how you would calculate psi sub s. Uh, sometimes it's also called osmotic pressure. And so um, if it's representing osmotic pressure, they use like a symbol that looks like pi, but it's giant. Um, and then you have this negative I CRT thing where I is the number of ions, C is the molarity, R is the ideal gas constant, and T is uh, the temperature in Kelvin, right? So you just plug and chug. Questions over those? Other math stuff. Okay, there are 68 questions that you will answer in 90 minutes on this exam. Of those 68 questions, five of them are uh, math questions. Okay, um, and those five math questions are going to have grid ins like this. Okay, so two things about that. Number one, these are the easiest questions on the exam. So no matter what, you want to do them first because this is five easy points 
that uh, that you can you know definitely get. A lot of times the answers are as simple as just like looking at a graph and like finding a point on the graph and then saying that's your answer. There's no calculations involved in them. They're like the easiest possible questions. Okay. Uh, number two, you want to do them first. So right when you get your test, go go flip to the back and do them because uh, these are grid in questions. And so if you run out of time and you have your five grid in questions to go, there's no way for you to guess what the answer would have been, right? You can't just grid in random bubbles. I mean, you can, but it's not gonna be right. There are like a million possible combinations here of bubbles that you could grid in, okay? Versus A, B, C, and D, you have 25% chance of getting right. Even if you didn't even look at the question, there's only A, B, C, and D. Right? So if you have to have five questions left over that you didn't answer and you're just going to bubble in, you want those five questions to be multiple choice questions rather than grid in questions because your probability goes significantly up of getting one of those correct. Right? Anyone have questions on any of this? Yes. 